So good morning. Good morning. I'm sure all of you recognize this logo, right? Um, this is Superman's logo, right? So this is just a little bit, if you'll bear with me for a minute, this is just a little bit of a, a background here. I was a bit of a comic book fan as a kid, and I was familiar with Superman like most people are. Superman was a character created by two Jewish guys, and I got their names here, uh, Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. So they made his story kind of like Moses in that they sent him as a baby. His parents sent him as a baby alone in a rocket ship to Earth, and he was adopted by um, a couple of uh, people. Uh, John and Martha Kent, if I remember correctly. But anyway, the Kents. He's, a, he's adopted by the Kents. And uh, so it's kind of like Moses, because if you remember, Moses was put in a little ark or a little reed basket and floated on the water, and then he was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, right? So there's just a little similarity, not exactly the same. Now, we think of Superman and his alter ego as being Clark Kent, right? That's his human name. Now, some of you may know his Kryptonian name because he was from this other planet, Krypton. I know, all fictional, but bear with me. Um, we're getting there. Anyway, but his Kryptonian name is Kal-El. And they did this on purpose, um, Vessel of God. He was meant to be a hero for everyone. If you remember... In the 30s, when they created Superman, if you remember what was going on, especially in Germany, the Jews, of course, were having a horrible time. And here are these guys, they wanted to create a hero for everybody, and at least in their imagination, right? So they created Superman, and his Kryptonian name was Cal El. So El is a Hebrew word for God. And you'll see this being used if you look at an interlinear Bible, you'll see it being used. And we're going to get into that. But uh, so his vessel of God, he was supposed to be a godly representative. You know, that was their idea of this, this comic book hero they were making. So he was from the house of El. They had these houses, these factions on Krypton. They referred to as houses. He was from the house of El. Again, kind of a reference to be, being from the house of God. So, let's see, um, if we look at it, it kind of goes along with some of the things you see in the Bible. Again, like Bethel is house of God. Basically, that's how we would translate or look at that. Beth equal, meaning house and El, again, meaning God. And then as an example, too, Bethlehem, house of bread, where you would expect to generally be able to find some food, that sort of thing. So, Bethlehem. So this is kind of a silly topic, starting off with comic books and stuff. I realize that. But the idea was, when I was young, this got me interested in some of the names of God in the Old Testament. And then uh, recently, me and uh, Kim, we had had a conversation about this, and it kind of got me started on that again, and we decided to kind of do a study on that. And this is going to be some of that that we've been doing, we're not done at all, but uh, this is going to be the fruit, the fr some of the fruits of our exploration into the names of God. So names of God in the Old Testament, what's in these names of God? Well, for the most part, they're describing the characteristics of God. They kind of, they kind of express his role to us and our role to him in this, you know, um, the names really turn out to be more of like attribute, attributes or characteristics, like I said. And it helps us to know and understand the Lord better. So especially in that relationship we have. So I have some of those names that I want us to look at today. And uh, if you've seen uh, some of my things on Facebook, one or two of these might be a repeat, but... Uh, most of it is not. And there's some things we had to repeat because some things build off of others. And you'll see that as we go. So, um, oh, and another thing, pronunciation. I'll do the best I can, but I'm not a linguist. I'm not very good at, at pronouncing other, other things in other languages. So 
We're just going to have to bear with me on that. So the first one I want to look at is simply L, the one we we're just talking about, really. In English, we really don't have a lot of words that mean God. So L means God, and there's others that also mean God to us. That's the way we do. Uh, I did include the Hebrew here just for fun, if you can do anything with that. That's, I, I can't. And the transliteration and the phonetics of L, how it's pronounced, L is the idea. And uh, the, the transliteration is different from, I use just a simplified English form at the top because that makes it easier for me. So I just want to show you that this is used like over 200 times in the Bible. Most of the times, or at least a lot of the times, L will be used in conjunction with some other word that would be like a descriptor. Like you might think of uh, one that a lot of people have heard of is El Shaddai. And we translate that a lot like uh, God Almighty or uh, God who uh, supplies everything. I, I forget the exact word for that. Sorry about that. But anyway, God Almighty works good. So if we look at... My first example here for this is in Genesis chapter 35, verse 1. Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there, and make an altar there to God. Now this God is El, um, who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. So this is an example where it's used by itself without a descriptor. There are examples like that in the Bible. Now, L can also be a uh, suffix, like we were showing earlier with Bethel, can also be a suffix to names, like Emmanuel, God with us. Or if you want to be really uh, literal, you could say with us, God, because it's the suffix. But nonetheless, in Ishmael, God will hear, and Israel contends with God, which we know that's what Jacob did. He contended with the Lord, right? So... L points to, it comes from, they believe it comes from another word, and it points to the power and might of God. As in, he is the God that has power, not to be confused with the powerless idols and things like that that people used to worship. So, now I want to look at a few of the combinations where L is used in combination with other descriptors. One is L. I'm always tempted to just say Roy, and that's not exactly right. If you look at the phonetics, it's Roe, and I I struggle to say that, but it's L Roe, and it's C's is what Roe means. It means C's, and so when you use it together, it's supposed to be the God who sees, and the the implication there is the God who sees me, right? That's the, that's the implication that He sees us. Um. Kind of like Ishmael, God will hear. The implication is God hears me. Um, that kind of thing. So if we look at an example of this in Genesis chapter 16, verse 13. Now this is Hagar. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees. For she said, have I also here seen him who sees me? So you are the God who sees is the way... That is translated there. And again, like I said, the implication was that he sees her, he sees us. So in this case, what was going on was uh, Sarah was treating Hagar harshly. Um, and that's after, you know the whole story. Okay, so Sarah comes up with this idea for Hagar to sleep with Abraham to produce a son, right? So then... When Hagar does conceive, she looks down on Sarah. She looks at her in a bad way and kind of, uh, let's see, I can't see if I can find the word here. Um, anyway, she thought, she thought less of Sarah and she didn't, you know, respond to her well. So, well, Sarah did not respond to that well and she started treating her harshly and, and, uh, basically just being mean to her. The idea was that she was browbeating her and beginning to oppress her, be, you know, unkind and mean to Hagar. So Hagar fled. And here Hagar is alone out by herself, feeling 
you know, abused and probably without a friend. And the angel of the Lord comes and tells her to return and that her descendants will be too numerous to count. And, and that's the point. El, El Roy is the strong and powerful God who sees you. When you feel lonely, abandoned, when uh, you feel like there's no one there and no one cares, God sees you, God knows, and God is with you, and he hears you, and he responds to you. He responds to your cry, even when you help create your own bad problem, which Hagar was partly responsible for her own problem because of the way she had responded. There was some back and forth there. So even then, God sees you and responds to you. He still sees and hears us. So we can always call on him because he does see us and hear us. Now, to go with this, there is El Gibor. Now, Gibor kind of has a double meaning, mighty and warrior. And there's also the idea of like a champion or victorious champion. Uh, but El already means, you know, mighty and power. So when this is used in combination, the idea is really that you have uh, this mighty hero or warrior. So let's see, uh, if we look at our example here for this, Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God is how they translate this here. And it is actually Gibor El. And that's why they translate it Mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. But the idea here is that Jesus is our hero, right? He's our victorious warrior and champion. He's our hero. So, let's see. Um... Like I was saying, Gibor also implies more than just might, because El already implies that. It already implies strength and power. And you'll see similar language here in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. Now, I took this from the New American Standard Bible because the King James Version, uh, the New King James Version didn't exactly translate this the same. Most of the translations think of it in this manner where Gabor is warrior, which I underlined here. And victorious was another word, which means uh, like save, savior, that type of thing. So the Lord, your God, is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He will rejoice over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. Just that the Lord is our he is our savior. He is our champion. He is our hero. Is so much of what this means to me. Um, so, and most of the translations agree with this idea that this is meant because warrior is Gabor here. And uh, when we need someone, you know, when we need someone to help, when we need something, he is the one that we can go to. Jesus. He's already really fought and won the victory for us. He has defeated our foes, and he is our champion, and that is the idea here of whether you say El Gabor or Gabor El. Gabor El is what I was seeing mostly, though. Um, nonetheless, there is another one. Um, El Olam, and I struggle to say Olam. I keep wanting to say Olam or something like that, but um, or... Again, I see it more mostly as Olam El, and Olam means everlasting, and that's just pronounced Olam. I had, I had to sit and listen to this guy pronounce these words, and I still probably don't have them really totally right, but that's okay. Um, so, if we look at Genesis chapter 21, verses 32 and 33, I'm really going to focus on 33, but for context, I wanted this here. Then Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And that was Olam 
L, everlasting God. And of course, this was for the purposes of doing a treaty, is what the idea was here. He was forming uh, a treaty or an agreement with Abimelech. And so when you want to know that your treaty or your agreement, your pact is going to will be watched over by someone forever, you call on the everlasting God, right? The one who is eternal, that will always be there to watch over that. So, no one else will be able to watch over that treaty or that pact for all time. And if we look at uh, Psalm 90, verse 2, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting, and this is Olam to everlasting, again, Olam, you are God, and that is El. And uh, again, stressing this everlasting to everlasting, compounding the idea that God is eternal beyond what we can imagine or think, that he is everlasting to everlasting. And while he is eternal, our problems here are really just temporary. They're minor. Um, his love and faithfulness to us will never change, and He is always here for us. We can trust Him. He is with us now, and He will be with us for all eternity. So now I want to look at the uh, actual name of God, Yahweh. Now, with the way ancient Hebrew especially was, they had no vowels. And so all we have is the consonants, and the consonants are these four, Y-H-W-H. -H. There's, there's a whole little history that goes along with this, but we'll just start with the basics here. Um, we pronounce it Yahweh, and when you see in the Bible, when you see LORD in all caps, most translations, if they translate L-O-R-D in all caps, that is usually what they translate for Yahweh, for his name. That becomes confusing for us in English. Unfortunately, that's, I would say that's an unfortunate side effect of that, the way that's translated, because we don't realize when that's there, or at least I haven't for most of my life, that that is actually the name of God they're representing. Because Lord, if you think about Lord, Lord is really a title, and we'll get into that more later. But, this is the actual name of God. Um, let's look at uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God, now Lord, is Yahweh. And then God here is another word. It's more of a generic term, like we would say God or gods. That's a generic term except when we're talking about the God of the Bible, right? That's, that's a limitation of English. But this is another term, Elohim, which means God. But when, he, when they say the Lord, and now this, my, my translation does not have it all caps. So your translation may not either. But if your translation does have it in all caps, that's a good sign that it's Yahweh. Mine doesn't have that, but I looked, I've been using an inter, interlinear Bible to go through all these things. And um, so... The Lord, or Yahweh, Yahweh God made the earth and the heavens. So that's the idea there. If we look at another example in Exodus chapter 3, verse 15. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord, now here again, this is really Yahweh. So it should read, Yahweh God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. So he's impressing upon them, really, that that is his name, Yahweh. And like I said, an unfortunate side effect of translating Yahweh into Lord, which is really more of a title, is that it comes off, you know, the Lord God of your fathers, and then you don't really understand about the name. So, anyway, just wanted to use those. Now, the other uses of God here in this verse is that same generic term, Elohim. So, that is just another generic term for God, meaning God. I don't want to get ahead of myself here. 
So, okay, so Yahweh is the personal name of God. And like I said, it's, it's normally translated as Lord in the English. And uh, that is uh, just one of those things we have to deal with and we have to understand. Part of the problem with the name of God, Yahweh, and those four consonants, Y-H-W-H, is that it was so considered so sacred in Judaism at one point that they basically stopped saying it. They were afraid they would say it wrong. And so they started using another word, Adonai, and they would say Adonai, even though it would be written as this y, um, Y-H-W-H, or Yahweh. And Adonai is another word we're going to get into later, but it means Lord. It's an actual title. It means Lord or Master. So that means, unfortunately, down through history, that they, they lost um, the idea of how that was truly supposed to be pronounced. When we say this is Yahweh, that is what most scholars seem to believe the pronunciation is. But it's unclear for sure what vowels they used with that because ancient Hebrew didn't have vowels. They just had their consonants. And so since they lost that oral tradition, there is, there is some question about that. But our best, our best thought, our best uh, idea at this time is that it's Yahweh. So, all right, so the letters being used here are Yod and He and Wa and He, and um, that's just the Hebrew letters being used, and that, that comes out to Y-H-W-H. Yahweh is the self-existent one. He has always existed, and he will always exist. We can rely on him because he is our eternal source. So now before I move on, I kind of want to mention Jehovah. If you're like me, I grew up here in Jehovah. That's all I knew when I was younger. Um, Jehovah kind of stems from a problem of translating from Hebrew to Latin and then going Latin to English. It's kind of like that game of telephone. The farther you get from the source, the more garbled things get. So Y-H-W-H equaling Yahweh in Hebrew, and then it was translated to like I-H-V-H in Latin, and Latin had some letters of the alphabet and not others. And anyway, I'm not a linguist, like I said, so I can't explain all of it. I can just kind of tell you what I could gather from studying, and then that, beha that became, whoa, sorry about that, that became Jehovah, and then later in English, Jehovah, uh, Latin, I don't think that has a J, so, and uh, so the I did some double duty there. Nonetheless, Jehovah is, was the uh, mistaken, I'll say, mistaken translation, and uh, you, you'll still hear Jehovah being used, and just, just want you to understand where that comes from and why that is. Uh, so now let's look at some names that that go along with Yahweh that we see used with Yahweh in the Bible. One is Yahweh. Let's see if I can say this right. Kadesh, and it means He sanctifies, He consecrates us, right? And that means Yahweh does this. So God does this. If we look at um, Exodus chapter 31, verse 13, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, this is God speaking, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. So that is, I am Yahweh Kadesh. It is the Lord who sanctifies. So if we look at another example in Leviticus, and this again is God speaking, you shall keep my statutes and practice them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. So notice this is God saying this. He is referring 
to himself in this way, only he forgives our sins and makes us to become holy like him. Only he can cleanse us and make us pure and true and loving like him. And he is who we call on when we repent and seek forgiveness and ask for forgiveness because he is the Lord who sanctifies us. He cleanses us from that. So another one is Yahweh Ra'ah, and that means shepherd. Ra'ah means shepherd. So he's Yahweh, our shepherd, and probably one of the most famous things, Psalm 23, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, that is Yahweh Ra'ah. I shall not want. And then later down here in Psalm 23, 6, I included this just for the sake of uh, it being another example of Yahweh, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord of Yahweh forever. And that's a promise to us that we will dwell in the house of God forever. But this is telling us like a shepherd that God watches over us. He guides us to the good things in life. If you think about the fresh streams, the green pastures, he guides us to the good things. He protects us when the wolves come, and we need to stay under his protection. We need to stay with his flock and not stray. We need to listen to his voice and not wander off. So another, another one to look at is Yahweh Rapha. I'm probably not getting that exactly right. But Rapha is, the idea is healer or heals. There's a number of different things that go with that. But basically, the Lord who heals, or Yahweh heals, and the implication is heals us, heals you, heals me, or the Lord is your healer, Yahweh is your healer. So when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, and they were at Marah, where the water was bitter, and they could not drink it, God changed the water so they could have water. And this is in Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. And again, this is God speaking. And he says, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. I am Yahweh Roth Rapha. And so the implication here being that the Lord heals us. Um, he is our physician and he heals us. He takes care of us in that manner. He provides all healing and he provides it through Christ Jesus. And it's not always the healing we think it is or that we expect. It's not always a miracle. If we look at Psalm 147, verse 3, this Rapha is used here. He heals the brokenhearted. And this is speaking again, of course, of God. But that's using that same name. I mean, that same word, Rapha. And just meaning that he heals us spiritually and emotionally and mentally and physically. He heals us in every way. And he wants us to be healed and whole. So another one, let's see, is it one more? Yeah, one more of these. Yahweh Nis. Now their phonetics was different, so I filled in my own phonetics if that looks strange. But that's because theirs did not go along with what, the way the guy was pronouncing it. So I'm going with the way the guy pronounced it, which was Nis, Yahweh Nis. And it means banner. Strictly speaking, in a literal sense, it means banner. Now in a figurative sense, it means that the Lord is our, or Yahweh, Yahweh is our victory. He is our sign of victory or our flag. If you look at Exodus chapter uh, 17, verses 13 through 15, I included all this for context. This was when they fought Amalek and Joshua and the people, you know, defeated Amalek. Really, God defeated them for them. But nonetheless, Moses built an altar and called its name, the Lord is my banner. The Lord is my 
flag my victory. And this is because the Lord gives us victory over the enemy. You know, Jesus has already fought and defeated the enemy for us, and he makes us victorious and more than conquerors through him. And it kind of goes along with the idea, too, if God is for us, then who can stand against us? He is our victory, Yahweh Nice. Now, to look at a few more general terms, Elohim is one that we'd mentioned earlier. And in English, it would be like us saying God or gods, depending on how you're using it. The, the literal meaning of Elohim is gods. It's actually more of a plural word. But it is used in a uh, singular sense for God, like we think of God, the Bible, for Yahweh. It's used in a singular sense for that, though there is one example here that's a little unique. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God, and this is Elohim, said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and then let them have dominion, so forth, etc. But the idea here is that's Elohim, basically a plural word, and then he does use plural in this verse of us and our. I think this simply just relates to the idea of God as the Trinity, that he is three in one. So I don't see that as a, a big deal or anything. I think that relates and that makes some sense. Now, some people may disagree with that, and that's fine. It's really not important. It's just one of those things that you'll note, and you may wonder about that. Well, Elohim is a plural word in its most basic sense. So... But it all depends on the context and the way the word is used as to whether or not it's referring to our God or if it's referring to gods, idols, that kind of thing. Because it can refer to that. Okay. Elohim also can relate or does relate to the idea of rulers and judges, divine ones and angels. Now, again, a lot of this is context driven in the Bible. I'm not a linguist, so, but the implication for us is that God is also our divine ruler and judge. And it's a good reminder that he's always in charge of everything when we think of this in relationship to God, our God. So, then we have a name that is not really a name. Some people will say this is a name of God, Adonai. I've heard it. There was a song... Y'all may or may not know this, back in the 70s called Adonai, or was it the 80s? Anyway, by this uh, Christian group Petra, Adonai, but it's really not a name of God. Adonai is really a title, like we would say Eng uh, in England, in English we would say Lord or Master. It is a title, it's not really a name. I put in my own phonetics beside theirs because the guy that pronounces this, and I've always heard it as Adonai, and... This looks like Adonai, which is, as far as I know, not correct. So I put in my own beside it. That's a long I, Adonai, is the way I've always heard it and understood it to be. And even the person that I was listening to from, I use uh, an interlinear Bible at studylight.org, and they'll give you the phonetics, and you can listen to somebody pronounce the word, the Hebrew word. That's what I'm talking about when I say the phonetics. So I was listening to the third person pronounce it, and they say Adonai. They don't say Adonai. All right. So let's see. Um, so Adonai is used about 400 times in the Old Testament and about 200 times in Ezekiel. And it is the title, like I said, Lord and Master or Lord or Master. It's acknowledging Yahweh as our Lord, our ruler, our king. He has authority over us. God is the Lord over all. So he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We are his subjects. We follow him and he cares for us and he protects us as our Lord. That's, that's what that title is supposed to mean, Lord. So here in this example, Genesis chapter 15, verse 2, this is Abram. Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliza of Damascus. Well, where he says, Lord God, what he is really saying in Hebrew 
is Adonai Yahweh. This is a rare time that Yahweh is translated God. And the reason is because he's using this title, Adonai, which means Lord or Master, before it. Otherwise, they could have just said Lord again for, Ad for uh, Yahweh, but they didn't. And it's because of that. We, otherwise, it would read Lord, Lord. Now, we would, if, when we hear somebody say Lord, Lord, what do we think? We think they're kind of in distress and stuff, which would kind of go with this. But that's not the, actually the intent here. The intent here is that Abram is referring to God in a very respectful, humble way. You know, my master, God, my master, Yahweh. Um, so he's talking to him in a very humble and uh, way. So Adonai Yahweh is actually the most accurate way to look at that. And uh, let's see. You can think of that as like Master God or Lord God, like they have it here. But uh, but the real idea is that Lord Yahweh, that's God's name with that title. If we look again for another example, similar, not exactly the same. But if you look in Judges chapter 6, verse 15, let's see, is this Gideon? Yeah, this is Gideon. So he said to him, speaking to God, Oh, my Lord. Now, this Lord is Adonai. So it's, oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest, and I am the least in my father's house. And he sees his own smallness, and he's acknowledging God over him. You know, he sees that he is, well, we are nothing compared to God, right? So he's seeing himself as being small, but he's also acknowledging God as his master and as his Lord. So before we leave this, we'll do one Ezekiel example. And he said to me, and this is God speaking to Ezekiel, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. And again, Ezekiel is saying, Lord God, and that is uh, like, um, is like Adonai Yahweh again. So it's like, Master Yahweh or Lord Yahweh, if you think of it as his name. So I think sometimes the importance of that to me is that sometimes we forget when we're speaking about the Lord because we have so few words that really equate to God and God gets translated, you know, his name gets translated as Lord in the Bible so much. Sometimes I think we lose this context of when we say the Lord, we're saying the one who has authority over us. We're acknowledging him as being our master and Lord. Not We're not just saying that's his name because Lord isn't really his name. It's just something to, to think about and recognize that, uh, you know, we recognize him as our provider and our protector as our ruler and our king, and what a ruler does, what a king does, really, is they protect their subjects. You know, they don't just rule them to order them about, but they protect them, they keep them safe, they keep the kingdom safe and stable, and they allow, you know, freedom within the bounds of their morality. And we're just recognizing that that's what our master does for us, that's what God does for us. And we're also acknowledging that we serve him as his servants, that that's what we do. So the last one, the last one, is a little unique, and I'll try to say it correctly, Atik Yom, which is what is translated as Ancient of Days. And you can see that in several different places, but I have the example here from Daniel, chapter 7, verse, <coughs> pardon me, Chapter 7, verse 9, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. Now, God is the Ancient of Days, and this description also matches what we see. We spoke about this in Revelation class of the Lord early in Revelation. Uh, so, this represents him, 
He was before the beginning and will endure after what we consider to be the end. He's the ancient of days. He is it's kind of like the everlasting to everlasting idea again. He is the wise creator and has authority over all. And we will all acknowledge him as Lord and Master at some point. So we want to... You know, we want to take away the impression here that this is our God that we're talking about in all these things. This is this is our God. This is his name, Yahweh, and that all these attributes and characteristics are his. He loves us and cares about us. He is powerful and eternal. He sees us and hears us and he responds to us. He heals us. He fights for us. He's our champion. He's our hero. He gives us the victory that he has won for us. He's our divine ruler and judge, cleansing us and forgiving us when we do not deserve it. Yahweh is our eternal master, kind and beneficent. He's our heavenly father and king. If if we ever think, if you ever think you're alone, if you ever think no one cares, I just want you to know that you're wrong. He sees and he cares and he's with you. And with all these thoughts in mind, if anyone here were to have any issue, have any need this morning, we would ask that you please come forward and make it known as we stand and sing. We'll sing 331, Kneel at the Cross.